today uh, we're going to be talking about stepping into victory. <laughs> I, th- I thought it was, uh, I was so surprised when Mark asked me to, to speak on that because it seems like such a heavy topic. And I, I mean, I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed with how big of a topic it is. He told me, and then the last couple of weeks I was just writing down all these notes and I had about 15 pages of notes and I had no idea how they were going to come together. Um, but we're going to be in Second Samuel today, and we're going to look at probably one of the vi- most victorious men in the Bible, and that's King David. So we're going to be in Second Samuel uh, chapter 5, and we're going to be reading uh, verses 17 through 25. So it's Second Samuel 17 through 25. And just to kind of give a background before we read this, what's going on in the nation of Israel is that, one, it's been split. You have the 11 tribes of Israel, and then you have the tribe of Judah. David from the tribe of Judah, and then all the rest over here. King Saul is here with Israel. There's been a massive civil war between the tribes of Israel and Judah because of the jealousy of King Saul hunting and seeking out David. David finding refuge in a cave. Um, more than that, it's not just that he had this cave to himself. He had these, I call them, band of misfits that came and, and stayed with him in the cave and joined him. And some of them were Israelites, but many of them weren't. And I think that's even foreshadowing of what God intended to do all along, because he's always about not just Israel. He's about everyone. And so he brings in all these other people, these rejects of society, some of them were murderers, some of them were um, thieves, liars, cheats. They had uh, walked away from their debts and ran away. Um, and all these men, they're, they're, some of them, they're mighty in war, but they're just, they're not good men. But yet they come to David. And uh, he begins his sort of journey um, while when he was a kid, he was uh, anointed by Samuel. But it was a private anointing. But he knew the call of God in his life when he was a kid. He was like 13 or 14, and he's anointed to be the future king of Israel. And uh, then we know that he fights David, or he fights uh, Goliath. And from then on, even through the victory over Goliath, when he was in the cave, when he started fighting and waging war against all these other little um, nations that surrounded Israel and Judah, he, when he would win, he would still give the spoils of war to the nation of Israel, even though they were fighting against him. Like his, his loyalty was still to God's people. And uh, the reason I'm saying all this is because this is leading up to right where we're about to read, where now King Saul has died, and then David is trying to unify the country. And he just, in the previous chapter... Um, I think, yeah, actually at the beginning of chapter 5, it says that David is anointed king over Israel. And so that time span is roughly about 17 years where he knew his calling and destiny and he had his first victory. And for 17 years, he's been waging war. And then now is the time when he actually has become the king. He stepped into his destiny fully. Like this is the biggest moment of his life bigger than the time when he defeated Goliath, because that was a stepping stone. This is like it. He even says, when he's anointed king, he realizes that God has anointed him to be king, to unify the nation of Israel, to grow the kingdom of God on the earth. Like, he understood his purpose, and now he's in it. And so this is where we're going to pick up the story. So uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17 through 25. It says, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood. Therefore, the name of this place is called Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. 
And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, You shall not go up, but go around to their rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. So in that, there's two battles. To really understand what's happened is that where the former boundary line between Israel and Judah was is right at the Valley of Rephaim. Jerusalem is up in the hills, and it's the stronghold that's referring to here in Scripture, and that sits right above the Valley of Rephaim. This is exactly where the Philistines come in. It's the point at which David had unified the nation and stepped fully into his destiny. And he hadn't hardly been on the throne, and immediately attack comes in right at the most vulnerable place. So the first thing to note is when it comes into stepping into victory, realize that the enemy is working just as hard as you are to try to get into your destiny, that he's trying to come against it, and he will find the vulnerable places. But we can take some examples of what David did and defeat him. And so the first thing is when the the enemies come in, it says that David inquired of the Lord. I know it seems really simple, but... God was really speaking to me uh, even last night as I was preparing for this. And one of the things he showed me is he challenged me to go through Scripture and find up until this point any time that David, since he defeated Goliath, had lost. That's like 17 years. And he hasn't lost. Every battle he went into, he won. There were times, sure, when he left and he was fighting in a battle and he came back and like his family and all of the families of his men had been kidnapped. But then, even in that case, he inquired of the Lord. And his men were grumbling, like, ah, oh, we can't make it. And some of them went. And some of them stayed behind. But he said, no, 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 no. I inquired of the Lord and he said that he'll give the Midianites into our hands. And they were outnumbered like 10 to 1. And they still won. Like, David, for 17 years... 17 years, was hiding out in caves and in hills, just causing havoc against the enemy, and winning for 17 years. Like, how how long have we been contending for the things of God and breakthrough in our areas? And can we say that we have a record like that? Every single battle for 17 years. I was like, okay, what would that be like for us today? And I love sports, so I started thinking about sports. So I was like, okay, 17 years of victory. Okay, that'd be like a star quarterback in the NFL gets drafted, and then for the next 17 years of his career, he never loses a game, and he wins 17 Super Bowls. (laughs) It's like, I love basketball. And for any of you who are familiar with basketball, you might have heard the name Coach John Wooden. If you're passionate about basketball, you've definitely heard the name Coach John Wooden. The reason being is because Coach John Wooden, um, he is recorded as the greatest basketball coach of all time. All time. The reason being is because his win percentage was 83%. Over his whole career. The man was coaching into his 60s or 70s, and he started coaching when he was uh, just, like, freshly 20. (laughs) 83%. That means that 83% of the time he stepped on the court, he knew he was going to win. That means if you were coaching against him, 83% of the time that you went against him, you were going to (laughs) lose. But David was, like, batting 100, or 1,000, excuse me. He's, like, perfect. He didn't lose. But why didn't he lose? Because it's not like the battles that he was facing were super easy. He was almost always outnumbered completely. And he didn't have like, he didn't have these trained men who knew exactly what they were doing. They were just rugged men with no lives. (laughs) Seriously. They had no lives. But David rallied them like God used him. And for 17 years he had victory. But each time he inquired of the Lord. And God started speaking to me about inquiring of God, like seeking him. 
Like we've been going through the series about supernatural steps, and seeking God has to be number one on the list. You cannot move forward it in any sort of realm of your life and have victory in any realm of your life if you're not seeking God's face. And I don't mean just like seeking Him, like you have your quiet time where you pull out your Bible and we're like, okay, God, this is my dedicated time to you for the next half hour. Actually, I don't even have anything after that. Let's push it out to an hour. You get an hour of my time today and I'm just going to sit and learn from you and teach me. I'm not even, like, that's amazing. But that's not even what I'm talking about. And think of David. David was lucky if he had the first five books of the Bible. He lived in the Bible times. Like, he wrote a good chunk of Scripture. So it's not like he was just always going to Scripture. And I'm not saying that to downplay the Bible at all. Because Scripture points to us and tells us that it is good for everything pertaining to life and godliness. So that means if this isn't ingested inside of here, then you already are not going to have victory. Like, this must get in here. So this is not to downplay the Word of God. It's to elevate it and to say that there's even more. You take the Word of God, but if you take the Word of God apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we have to seek Him. If we're not, before we read Scripture, if we're not... Lord, I ask you to speak to me. Holy Spirit, make these words come alive. Move through me. If we don't do that, we're just reading words. The words have power because it's like they're laced with the Holy Spirit. That's where the power is. That's where his grace is. And so David sought God. And not only that, it's not like God totally challenged me to think about how we hear from God. And oftentimes I think of like, oh, these amazing men of the Old Testament. Uh, Wow, like God's always speaking to them and telling them stuff. And they just hear so clearly. Like, wow, wouldn't that be great if that was how he talked to me? I always got to strain and try really hard to hear him. And God's like, Josh, did I change? Am I still the same? And there's nothing in this text that says God spoke with an audible voice and said, David, I will give you the victory. It just said, the Lord said. But how many times when you're telling a testimony, you're sharing something meaningful that God did in your life, and you're sharing it with somebody close that you know, how many times do you say, well, I felt like this sense of like goodness that made me think that maybe God was kind of leading me in this direction. (laughs) No, we say God said. And the reason we know that is because we're his sheep. And in John chapter 10, Jesus referring to himself as a good shepherd said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They know my voice. One thing that uh, being married has really shown me is that uh, we're very different. <laughs> we're so different. Uh, we're, we're different on so many different things. Uh, one of the big things is that Audrey is such a, she's such a sweetheart. She's so tender and gentle. Her spirit is so pure and so, it's almost like angelic. Like you, you don't, you don't say anything harshly. Like, the biggest, man, the, the hardest thing that I've had to learn is to cut out sarcasm. That, that's, that's the worst. Actually, it literally means, it, sarcasm literally means a, a sinful pit. So, do with that as you will. But what God was showing me is that the way that he speaks to my wife is different than he speaks to me. He doesn't speak two different messages because he never contradicts himself, but he speaks differently. How he speaks to my wife is something along the lines of, uh, say she's wanting to go down a certain path, and God knows that's not his best for her, or that's not where he wants her to go. With me, he'd say, stop what you're doing, that's not what I have for you. He has to be really clear and direct because I'm very black and white, and 
I'm very much like, I need to be, tell me what to do or not to do, and I'll do that. With Audrey, she needs something more like, I love you, daughter, and I want what's best for you. And you can do that, and I'll be in it with you. But if you do this other thing, I really want you to do this other thing. Like, it's so much sweeter, so much nicer. <laughs> but the, the reason I say that is because David, for 17 years, has been learning how to hear God's voice in the most critical of situations. It's not just spiritual battles that he was facing for all those years. And I, I can't even imagine the kind of spiritual warfare that he was going through. But it was like hand-to-hand combat. It was intense. And for 17 years, he had to know what God said. When we're coming to a pivotal point in our lives, and we seek God, we must know for certain what he is saying. We cannot, we, we, we cannot approach something and give a half-hearted seeking of the Lord and then just trust that, well, I know enough of Scripture, so this seems like the right way. If we, if we do that, we just spin in circles and go round and round. But if we actually see God and we trust and know that He's our loving Father, and He has a voice and He's given us a spirit to understand what His voice is saying, and that it's our right as His children to hear His voice, then that means we can be like David and inquire of the Lord every single time and hear Him every single time. And so David seeks the Lord. He's patient. He doesn't immediately go against the enemy. David knew what his destiny was. He knew what his calling was. And he knew that the Philistines were coming into territory that didn't belong to them and that they needed to get out. He knew it, but he didn't just march up against them. Instead, he waited and he's like, well, let's see what God has to say. Sometimes when we know what our destiny is and we know what our calling is or we know what is the right way, we're too quick to move in it. And it's not that hard to just pause for a moment and say, okay, Lord, this seems like it's the right way. This seems like this is contrary to who you say that I am. This seems like it's contrary to the path that you've chosen for me to walk through so that I can bring others into breakthrough and freedom. But is now the time? And that's what David did. And then the Lord answered him, and he said, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And then it says that David came to Baal Perazim and defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a flood. Therefore, the name of the place is called Baal Perazim. Do you guys know what that word means, Baal Perazim? It means bursting through or breakthrough. Do you guys know what the Valley of Rephaim is? The Valley of Rephaim refers to a race of giants. And that was the land that they inhabited. And in fact, Goliath comes from the Rephaim. The enemy really isn't as smart as we think he is. See, he tried to use fear to grip David. That's what he tries to do to us. He tries to grip us with fear. And he'll even use a past victory of ours to still grip us with fear. And if you think he won't, you're on shaky ground. Because pride can get in there. And when pride gets in, all bets are off. There's been like a lot of talk lately about uh, unity in the church and how disunified we have been as a church at large. And that's kind of like what was going on here in the story with Israel and with Judah, there's so much disunity. And yet God brought them together and put them into unity. And David fought for that unity. And he fought for it in a place where he had formerly had victory that God had blessed him in. And the point at which he did have the victory was named Breakthrough. <laughs> like, what are the areas of your life that you're contending for? That is not a downer area of your life. That is not a bummer area of your life. It's a point of breakthrough. The enemy doesn't want you to know that. 
He doesn't want you to know that when you're facing a hardship or there's something that you've been contending for and believing God for and it doesn't happen and you've been contending for maybe for years, he wants you to get focused on the fact you've been contending for it for years and it hasn't happened instead of saying, this is breakthrough. That's what God says. He says it's breakthrough. Maybe it's that, maybe, maybe your breakthrough area is that you have unsaved family members and you're kind of losing hope that they'll get saved. You're kind of losing hope that they'll find their way and that God will grip their hearts. They are breakthrough. That's their name. Their name is breakthrough. And maybe they haven't stepped into it yet, but they will. Because God is faithful, and he would that no one would perish. Maybe for some of you, the area of breakthrough is some area of your life, former life, maybe a struggle that you have. Maybe it's lustful eyes. That area of breakthrough for you God just wants to set people free. That's his whole purpose, to set people free so that we can come into a family with him. And what's so interesting of what David does after that happens, he gives the glory to God. When the victory comes, he gives the glory to God. He doesn't claim it for himself. And he says, oh my gosh, did you guys see how how God just burst forth through the ranks? Did you see how he did that? Do you see how he burst forth through the enemy? Do you see how he crushed him? That's what God says. That's that's what he does, and that's what we're supposed to do when we get the breakthrough, is to say, we're supposed to tell people, did you see, have you heard how God broke through in my life? Did you see how God broke through in that person's life? Did you see it? That's what we're supposed to do. That's what David did, and that is another key to victory. He's done that for 17 years. He, he sought the Lord. He heard his voice. He knew God's voice for himself. And then when he goes into battle, he trusts that God is already giving him the battle because he heard the voice say the battle is won already. And then when it's won, then he gives glory to God and gives him all the credit, even though it was David that led the army. He gives God all the credit for that victory. And here's why. Though Christ had not come yet, Scripture does say that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. That means whether, you, whether it's Old Testament, who is Old Covenant, those believers who put their faith in God, or whether it's us here in the New Covenant, we all come under Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, that was total victory. The war has always been between God and Satan. It's not between us and him. It's not us and Satan. We're players in this. God is using us to get glory. He's using us to free us up to become part of his family. So the total victory was won at the cross. So the way that I think of it is it's like, it's like a pie. You can think of whatever pie you want. I like a lullaby pie. You could have peach pie, apple pie, whatever pie you want. But the whole pie... That's total victory in Christ. That's what Jesus did on the cross. In fact, if you think that you can't somehow live up to what God has for you and you feel sometimes down because of mistakes you make or whatnot, in 1 John, he actually contradicts that and said, not when you sin, but if you sin. And that's because of what Jesus did on the cross. You can read about it in in, uh, Romans chapter 5. I don't really have time to talk all about that right there, but Romans chapter 5, go there and you can learn about how exactly Christ defeated sin and death forever. But that's the, that's the truth. The total victory is in Christ, and that, that's the big pie. Now, the slices of the pie are the battles. So if the whole thing is total victory in Christ, and the whole thing is already Christ's victory, it belongs to him, then where did we go wrong when we think that the slices the battles that we face are somehow ours. David knew the battle wasn't his. He knew it for 17 years. Every time, even when the odds were against him, every time he sought God.
the battle is never ours. And when we say it's ours, it's probably because we're having a little bit of an identity crisis. It's probably because we kind of forgot a little bit about who our loving Father is and what He's done for us and what He continues to do for us day after day after day. And it breaks His heart when we think that the battle is ours. It breaks His heart because one of the things He loves to do most is to free us up and let us experience total freedom in Christ. And He hates to see us struggle to try to win things on our own. What it looks like to partner with God in victory is one to say, God, this situation I face, my financial crisis right now is not my battle. Now, maybe for some of us, we cause the issue. Don't claim mistakes you've made to determine who you're going to be in the future. And don't claim mistakes you've made to say how God will behave in the future towards you. He's not some angry God that's going to make you suffer through something. The battle is his. So what does it look like if we have a struggle with our finances and maybe we've made some mistakes in the area of our finances? It says, God, I am so sorry for mishandling and, and not stewarding your gift well. So I surrender it now and I ask that you would now come over and take over And I'm just going to worship you, and I'm going to continue to live my life for you. And I know that as I make steps in financial freedom, that you are going to back me up more than 100%. Then the pressure is not on you anymore. All you're doing is doing your job. You're working hard. You're doing the best that you can. And God, your heavenly Father, who has all the storehouses of heaven, is coming now and backing you 100%. So the battle isn't yours. Right after the, that first battle takes place, there's this, there's this little gap in which David goes out with his men and they go out to the field and they collect all the idols. Right after that, there's another battle. What God was speaking to me about that is that when he gives us a point of breakthrough in our life, it's up to us to steward that breakthrough well. God is a jealous God. He will not contend with anyone else. He'll have it all. And we're most free when we give him all. And if he is so gracious to give us victory in an area of our life and take us to the next level, then we should, with joy in our hearts, go and collect all the junk and clean up the mess and just get it out of there. Keep moving forward. Steward the gift of God well. Steward the promise that he gave us well. Steward the victory and the breakthrough well. And that's what David did. And he was not so lofty of a king to just stand up in his ivory tower and command his soldiers to do it. But he got in there with them. Maybe for some of us, things are going pretty great. And there's not really so much that we're contending for in breakthrough. Then maybe it's our responsibility to be like King David and get down and be humble and come alongside somebody else who is contending and say, I'm in this with you. I'm in the trenches with you. We're doing this together. You're not alone. And when there's a mess to be cleaned up, I'll still be there, and I'll clean up the mess with you. That's what it looks like to be a part of a family. That's what it looks like to be part of God's family, because that's what he does for us. And we're supposed to be like Christ. That's the most Christ-like thing we could do, is come alongside our brothers and sisters, help them in battle, and then clean the mess up when it's done. And when we do that, it completely removes a foothold for the enemy. It's like slamming the door. Like, you can't come through there. You're not coming back through. If you do, you're going to be sorry. That should be our attitude. That should totally be our attitude. Like, who is he to do that to us? We're heirs. We're co-heirs with Christ. Does he have any idea what he's doing? How dare him? You know that in Revelation it says that when uh, he's, he's called the accuser of the brethren and that we're going to be all there with all the angelic hosts, with our loving Savior. And then at the end, when he gets thrown into the pit of hell, you know who gets to throw him there? We do. Put him in front of a tribunal, and we're like, okay, here's the, here's the guy who caused all that issue. What do you want to do with him? What's, what's the vote? <laughs> <laughs> like, he accused us all our lives, and then in a righteous, virtuous, justful act, God gives us the grace to come alongside and partner with him one last time. Say, nope, you're done. 
why don't we just start practicing now? Why don't we get good at it now? I'd like to get good at that. So we clean up the mess, and we don't allow a foothold for the enemy. That sustains our victory. We sought him. We heard his voice, his specific voice to our heart. He gave us the victory. We praised him and gave him glory. We told all that we could about the amazing things that God has done. And then we cleaned up any mess that there was, and we shut the door on the enemy. Said, you can't come in here anymore. We just sustained our victory. We continue to do that. Our life, that's how it looks like to move from glory to glory. We go up like that as we continue to follow that process. But then in verse 22, the Philistines came up again, and they settled again in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord again. But this time God said something different. He said, you shall not go up, but instead go to the rear, and when you hear my marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you will know that I surely have gone out before you and given you the victory. And it says that David did all that the Lord said, and he got the victory, and then they pushed back the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. Okay. Again, God is trying to convey a message. In case we didn't get it the first time, his message is, the battle is not yours. The first time, God just spoke. He said, yeah, I'm going to give you the victory. Go for it. That's a good plan, David. Do it. Go up against them. The second time, he's like, no, 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 don't go up against them. Um, I want you to go behind. Go behind their ranks. And then you're going to hear me, the Lord of hosts, coming through the balsam trees. You're going to hear me thunderously marching towards your enemy. And when you hear that, you know that I've gone before you and the, the victory's already won. It's like even more, he's like upping it. He's like, you have no idea how exceedingly good I am. You have no idea what I'm capable of. Just follow me. I already got this, David. Thanks for coming to me, but now do what I say and let's do this. Let's do this plan. This is a better plan. You had a good plan the first time, but the second time, this is my plan. David didn't rely on previous victories. He didn't rely on his 17 years of victories. He didn't rely on the victory that God had just given him after just unifying the nation, after just stepping into his destiny. He didn't rely on that victory. Again, he still went and sought the Lord. And thank God he did because God had a different message for him. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But thank God he gave us the Holy Spirit. Thank God that he has given us the mind of Christ, ability to... For the Holy Spirit, as it says in Corinthians, he searches the depths of God, the infathomable depths of God, and he brings back messages and gives them to us. That's strategies. That's his love. It's him conveying the depths of God to us, finite human beings, but filled with the power of God. I loved what Rich said about Christ and us, the hope of glory, and for us to think about that. There is no greater victory that can come when you meditate on who your father is and what he's done for you and the fact that he has set Christ in you as the hope of glory. That's the hope of glory of the whole universe. (laughs) Like, why do we think we can't win sometimes? Or why do we take ownership of battles that aren't ours? They're always God's. The amazing thing about it is uh, at the end, it says that he, the Lord drove them and struck them down, the Philistines, as far as Geba to Gezer. We don't really have a map to show, but you have Israel here, and it stretches down through this area. The Valley of Rephaim is right about here. Then you have the sea, which is over here, and this little sliver here is the Philistines. There's this neutral area. The Philistines crossed over the neutral area, and they came into the Valley of Rephaim. They came into Geber, Or Geba. Yeah. And when God answered David's prayer and gave him instructions and David followed them, the first victory was amazing. The second victory was second to none. He took the enemies and pushed them back to the sea, all the way back. He completely got them out of the way. The first time, it was up to David to shut the door clean up the mess, and keep his eyes on God and keep moving forward. The second time, God's like, well done. 
What should I do now? <laughs> like if, if we keep having these same battles that we're facing, rest assured that God sees your faithfulness each and every time, and every single time the enemy tries to come back again, God is coming back even stronger. We have a few minutes left here. And uh, one of the things I really felt like God was stirring was uh, for people to really be known by him. That everything we just kind of talked about and went through, it's all amazing and it's so good. But none of that begins unless we first have the foundation right. We have to have our heart set on him. We have to live a life surrendered to him. And I love this church family, and I love all the amazing things that God does through our congregation and as people come in. I love seeing healings. I love seeing people get prophetic words that lift them up and move them into the place of their calling. The thing I love most is seeing people get saved. I think that's the thing that God loves most, too. And... uh, if you feel like you've not really ever made that decision to let Christ be your total victory, then I just want to invite you to receive him. Because it breaks God's heart to see people made in his image trying so hard to do it by themselves when all he's asking for is just to receive what I've already given. So if you feel like you've never received Christ, uh, then this is definitely for you. Another call that I felt like God had was that uh, if you feel like there's been an area of your life where you've tried to take ownership of a battle you're realizing it was never yours to take, then this is for you too. Like I said, today will be a day of breakthrough. Today is a point of breakthrough.